Well, it says you're live. So here we are. Welcome to Drag Boss Garage. My name is Tim Halstead. I see there's a couple people here already. Bill, if you're ready. William, welcome. You seem to miss some of the videos or the live chats I have usually on a Friday because you have a family night. That's great. Um, I was going to have the kids here, but they want to get some stuff for the pool. So it's just going to be me. Uh, I'm going to call Larry Olson in a couple of minutes. I figured I'd catch up with some housekeeping type stuff. Um, there's 13 people here. So say hi. Uh, we're going to have Larry Olson on. Now, I've never even heard of Larry Olson until a guy named Mike Brandon hooked me up with him. Now, Mike messaged me from Facebook and said, hey, <clears throat> I know this guy that's got um, some Glidden stuff that you might be interested in. You know me, I'm always interested in that kind of stuff. So I said, hey, let's see what they got to say. So he gave me the number and told me to call him. And, and I, he told me about some of his history that he learned from him in the pro stock years. See, he's the man behind the scenes. And that, that's the crazy thing. And I'm going to leave it right there. And we'll get to it <clears throat> when he comes on the phone. We'll finish that story. But I want to give a big shout out to everyone at Dragway 42 for the fast Fords at 42. That was a great event. I really enjoyed it. My kids were into it. They've really never been to a drag race. Uh, and now that they're older, 7 and 10, they can enjoy the uh, exhaust fumes, the smoke, and the noise. So that's awesome. And <clears throat> the thing that I kind of blew me away when I started talking to this guy is that he's really low profile, like I said. And he started talking about things that he has done in the past. And it just started the hair stood up on the back of my neck. I was like, wow, this guy has been there. Yet I've never heard of him because he's kind of behind the scenes. You know, he worked with Bob Glidden on the E460 head uh, and the block that's associated with that. And I can give a few shout outs now. So instead of interrupting him or talking to him, but yeah, Scott McConnell, you're here, pro stock for sure. You're gonna find some secrets that's gonna blow you away. Um, Anarchy is freedom, appreciate you sharing with us yep appreciate it that you're here so you're going to learn a lot of secrets from him about pro stock you know he was behind grumpy jenkins did his cylinder head work um i suspect he did the intakes too he built sheet metal intakes for guys um like i said he did glidden's e460 stuff i don't know what else he did we're gonna delve into that and find out he also did warren johnson's heads and intakes so he was the man that made the power. I mean, Warren Johnson, right here, look, guys. I had this when I went to see him, and this was had to be 98 because the last date on here is 99, and he went 200 miles an hour, the first at 200 miles an hour. So I had him sign it, and that's when I saw the big boys back in the day. They're all now gone. And one of the things that we were talking about, Larry Olson and myself, was he's still friends with – Warren Johnson. And I said, well, what do you think about getting him on DBG? He said, hey, we could probably get that arranged. So that would be cool to have Warren Johnson here. And uh, we could talk about the rivalry between him and Glidden, you know, and just pro stock in general. So I appreciate the guys that are here. Um, some of the things that, that he was telling me about, I've heard from another guy. And he told me that AMC was running aluminum heads and blocks back in the day. Now I'm talking pro stock days with Wally Booth, um, Dick Aarons, Maskins, Canner, Minorino, those guys. So back then they were using, he said, aluminum heads and blocks. So what a weight break there, boys. So they could move that weight around on that car wherever they wanted. Um, maybe he'll give us some experience on that because I heard that as a hearsay from someone um, who told me about it. 32 people here. Now, I don't know if this thing's not working yet or no one's really talking because they probably don't want to hear me talk, but um, maybe tomorrow I can, uh, this pile of boxes back here, I just want to get rid of it. That's all the stuff I've gotten in the past few weeks, stuff I bought and stuff I've gotten sent to me. So I want to get that cleared up. Uh, I have a new plan now with the Drag Boss Mustang. I'll give you a fill on that. Uh, Mike Weeks was pivotal in dragway 42 the fast forwards at 42 so i appreciated all the help he's done for me in the years past so what he wants to do what we've talked about 
the one side of the torque box of the drag boss Mustang has a little rot. The rest of it's perfect. You can just plate that over and I'm happy. What's up, Dr. Ron? Glad you're here. Griffith's Garage. Larry Olson, local legend, EPD, dominated the era of stock. You really saw an EPD decal ran in pro stock. That's why he's the guy and Larry. That's it. He's under, <laughs> he's the un, un, unsung hero, but he likes it that way. He told me he likes to just be quiet and go in and just kick ass. That's what he's about. So see, now I forgot what I was talking about. But anyways, oh yeah, back to the story. So Mike Weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to drop the Drag Boss Mustang off there sometime in August. And he's going to put in the transmission with a clutch and flywheel. I may get that from Aronson. I don't know. I'm going to talk with him, see what he recommends. Um, he's going to put that in. I have one of the original JR headers back here. I'm going to have him fix that. So we're going to put that car back on the way it was when Eric raced it. And it was coming off the road in like 2002 or something. So that'll be pretty cool. And if I can get Todd Heelman to do the wiring so I don't have to go through all that, Todd, I'd be really grateful for that. So think about that. Hi, Terry Grover. Good to see you, too. So I've got a couple of minutes, and I, and I like to talk, and because and, I haven't done a live chat in, I don't know, probably at least three or four months, because I don't have much to say. So I, I don't get on there, and, and every week I'm doing a live chat on something, because it doesn't mean anything to me. I want to bring um, pro stock back. I want to bring educational, racing education to you, stuff that you're going to learn about, okay? Who ever heard of a double short-term radius? Yeah, well, he's going to tell you about it, because I think that was what he told me. Is that what went the top mile an hour in NASCAR with the Ford heads? Well, we'll see. See what he's got to say. Check it out. Pi Martin Nielsen. Greetings from Norway. Peace, brother. It's good to see you, too. We got 31 on here. I figure with what I posted, we better have a couple hundred on here. Because I'm telling you, we're going to get some good stories from them. And I won't talk about his current company. It's on the description. I'll let him kind of get into it, and I don't want to introduce him with a part of that. But he now works um, with another gentleman and works, I guess he owns the company called LSX Concepts. They do a lot of superchargers for LS motors, all kinds of bracketry, um, fittings, pretty cool stuff. And what else do we got going on? Oh, I made a cool video, which is going to be coming out this weekend probably, of the number nine Maverick. Mike Weeks and uh, Sarah, who owns the car. So that'll be pretty cool when you see that coming from the ground up to running and ready to rock and roll. That was a great Ford event. It reminded me of Ford Expo and fun Ford weekend back in the day. Uh, John Kmeyer was there, and it was a great time to see him. And Gary Varney, great to see you. Brian, I don't know if you were there. Um, but I missed you. Let's see who's else here. Raging Bull 340. Mopar guy here, but I love Ford stuff. No hate here. There ain't no worry about it, man, because he's going to talk about GM. He's going to talk about the heads. He made heads. Stuff from Brodix casted for him. So it's he was a Chevy man, I can see. He did Ford stuff. He did Pontiac. He did redid the Pontiac Furo cylinder head so they get 10 more mile an hour, 12 more mile an hour, because it was used as a pace car and couldn't keep up with the regular NASCARs. So he recasted the head. He'll tell you the story. Blow your mind. Don Wilson. What's up, Don Wilson? Good to see you. For those of you who've been watching, <clears throat> I put up a good video of Zeus. He's big now. He's six months. He's been going to canine training. Uh, awesome dog. I mean, he. it's just amazing to see the transformation, how he behaves and how he acts. Obedient. He's right there to protect our family, and he's a watchdog. There's no doubt about that. You come around here, he'll he knows he'll let you know. So it's been great to to work with them. North North Coast K9 Trading. Rotor 22. We need more Ford events like the Great. Yeah, we do, man. You're right. We really do. You know the No Name Nationals. John Wilborn. He's probably on here. I haven't seen him on here. Um, he's been asking me if I'm going to that. And you know what? I don't know. My car isn't done yet and I never made it to where I said I was going to go on the 16th or excuse me the 17th for the fun Ford fast Fords at driveway 42 uh, there were some issues with the headers not being done 
and my buddy's feeling better now. So let's get those done, JP. We're ready. Hopefully within the next two weeks, I'll have to drag Boss Cougar out. And we're going to start working. It was going to be my daughter and I tomorrow, working on the Mustang, finish up the body. But now what our plan is this, and, and I don't want to digress, but I'm giving him that time to 6 o'clock. And I want to get all this stuff out since I haven't been on in a while. But the plan with the Drag Boss Mustang, I'm going to get the body finished as far as buffed out, underhood all cleaned up and repainted, interior all done up and repainted. And then we'll put it on the trailer and we'll take it to Mike's Week somewhere in August. So we could probably hit the track with that in September. That would be a nice goal right then. Can Zeus lift a Cleveland High Port Pro Stock head? He can lift the port plate without any issue. That head, you know, he's just losing his puppy teeth and his other adult teeth are in, so he's not good at the cast iron. We have a huge bone. It's kind of funny. I have a picture. It's like this cow bone. It's like this big. He's got it dragging the thing along. But he's a pretty cool dog. I never had a dog as an adult, and it's a great experience. And I thought I could train him myself because I'm a smart guy, I thought. And believe me, if you ain't a dog trainer, get professional help if you need it. And that's what we did. I got to a point where I just, he was getting unmanageable. And at 50 pounds at six months, there's no time to play. So it's great to have him part of our family. The kids are training him. I'll put a video up of the kids training him. So let's see, 556, we could probably call him. We got 38 people. That's getting, that's getting to be a full house. I don't want to miss anybody. Um, I got the AC on in the Drag Boss garage because it's like 87 to 90. I think it was today. Yesterday it was like 95. So it's been killer hot here. But it's been nice and cool in here. And I got a new computer chair. You can see the Ford Blue and a desk to match. It's really like a gaming setup. But I'm going to – I'm redoing the garage. I'm going to put up some nice OSB on the side so I can make it a nice-looking set, so to speak. But let's see. Anything else? It looks like we're ready to call them. And hopefully there's no issues. Let's get those likes up. Yeah, you know what? I I, I think I, I put up that great video of 42. I thought I'd get a bunch of subscribers, but probably only got about 15 or 16. And it's not all about subscribers, but I do like that likes because that gets you up on that um, algorithm for, for YouTube. But you also got to make videos once a week, and I haven't been doing that. So that's my own fault. But I have a lot of cool videos. Wait till you see them. Just me getting my ass in gear. All right, let's see. Here we go. Now, hopefully you can hear him and I can hear him. Hello. Larry Olson. Yes. What's up, Master? How are you? Oh, just uh, coasting along. There it is. In the life, in the flesh. It's good to talk to you again, my friend. Yes. I, uh... So here's, here's how it's working. So you got a, a scoop of how it's online. Right now we're on video on YouTube on my channel. There's, right. there's We've been on for 13 minutes. I did some BSing and talking about some stuff. Um, there's about 30, there's 38 people listening right now. Uh, a bunch of the guys that I know that are regulars. So I, I kind of, I wish I would have had more time to put it out. But the way our schedules work, it just worked out the way it is. So I'm glad that you're here and I appreciate you taking the time because you're the man behind the scenes that no one knows. And I like that. So you know, often, often the shadow. So here's what I was going to do. I kind of talked to you and preempted this a little bit and, I, and I'll throw it out there again. And then we'll just take off running and see where we get. And for you guys that are watching, you know, we're not, we're not putting, talking about information so we can talk about what camshaft to use in, you know, 396 Chevelle. We're not doing any of that tech stuff. We're going to talk about history where pro stock came from where it went in the it's high heyday and what happened and larry's opinion what he's doing now he's working now he's with a company called um lsx concepts we'll get into that at the towards the end of the discussion it's a wicked company like i said before that makes superchargers and a lot of bolt bracketry and bolt-on stuff for ls motors and a lot of fittings so it's a good company that he's developed He's 75 now, and I guess he hasn't learned that you can retire when you want. So here's how it goes. You ready, Larry? Hey, go for it. All right. And I hope you guys can hear me because 
the way I have it set up, the phone is right next to the speaker and I'm hopefully talking loud enough. So here we go. So basically what I want to know, Larry, is you've been it since the beginning, since let's say 1970, you were working on engines of high performance of some caliber in 1970. Am I right or wrong? Right. Okay. Were you involved with any of the early pro stock when it was the big block air before it went to like 72 and went to small block stuff? Uh, yes, I was, uh, I was getting into it, uh, all in, uh, in the mid seventies when the, uh, uh, Vegas were becoming popular when Jenkins started doing the Vega. Sure. And, uh, I got into it then. And, uh, um, uh, I had uh, been in the military and going to college and everything and got a job at uh, Valley Head Service as the hot tanker and worked my way up to manager and did everything from porting and flow bench work. Uh, okay. Um, I actually ported under an, another person, um, um, Hogan, Hogan's. Was yeah, sheet metal intake. Hogan's manifold. Yeah, yeah. He uh, he lived in the same apartment building I did. So uh, wow, we worked this together is... in in Portion years ago. So uh, and um, this is history, guys. I worked up the manager at uh, at um, Valley Head Service, and uh, I did um, started to meet a few people and handled special projects. I handled Warren Johnson. Uh, at Valley Head Service when he wanted the world's best exhaust ports. And we developed an exhaust port that flowed equal, virtually equal to the intake port at the time. And we learned that it didn't make any difference. If you can't get it in, don't worry about getting it out. Got it. That's a good rule so, of thumb. <laughs> <laughs> well, and uh, so, uh, and every time we played with the exhaust ports, to, to make it most efficient, it's a matter of just picking the right camshaft okay. with the right exhaust port. Let, let, so, me inter, let me interject this while you're talking exhaust ports. What's what's the best shape, do you think? Um, I don't I don't think shape is all that important. A D shape is is easiest to to get the valve bowl and the short side radius uh, out out to the header. Okay, but but. We've we've used uh, um, depending on where the head bolt is. We've we've had an L on one side, rod on the other. So uh, uh, just a matter of the mechanics getting it in, okay. and uh, um, and then it's a matter of, of the brake velocity, not necessarily the flow number, but how the velocity that it flows at the extractor effect. Right, I understand. You mean the scavenging? Is that what you're saying? That that contributor. Right. Okay, and uh, uh, in fact, when we did the the prototype E four sixty hit, it's not on the marketed one. We actually had removable exhaust ports, so you could play with exhaust port sizing. So your so and, was it a flange that bolted onto the main casting, and you could change the shape? Yeah, you could just the because of the way the head bolt pattern is on the Ford, it went over the top of the head, the, the short head bolts yeah. on the. Um, Bob Lydon had his own head bolt pattern, so it would drop over the, the head bolt, and uh, um, you could put different port shapes and sizes and everything else. It just slide over over the heads, header studs. So you're saying that Bob Glidden had his own bolt spacing? Not bore well, spacing, but bolt spacing. Yes, the Bob Glidden cylinder head, which is the E460, yep. has its own head bolt pattern to fit the Bob Glidden block. Block, yes. Okay, I've read that. And you the, made it so it could have 10 the, head bolts, right? What the what the people at Ford didn't know is I designed the E460. I also designed the core boxes so you could put the 10 bolt head in it, but they've never they've never drilled it for 10 bolts. Even though the core prints are there, you can Take the 460 head and slide dowel pins in them and cap weld them on both sides and drill them 10 bolt. Wow. And, so, Glid uh, and Glidden never and did the oil, that. The oil returns are still in the right place. It's it's one of those one of those things I thought to broaden the sales parameter, but okay. It, uh, 
So, but uh, that was that was a brother to the DRC head at the time. The, the, the Oldsmobile head, DRCE. Yeah, the, yeah. The DRC. I I I did the DRCE head for uh, uh, Warren, and and so when and Bob kind of wanted to follow in that in that logical pattern. So it was it was not the same, but it was similar. The E four sixty head and the DRC head are similar. Right. The okay. The DRC is about in its sixth revision, so you know it's like the DRC E one or two. Got it. Okay. So let's because let's go back a little so we don't go so fast. Let's start okay. like in mid seventy five. Now you were doing all the head work and intake work for Grumpy's toy is Vega. Am I right? No. Okay. No, I did. I did all of uh, Grumpy's um, uh, pit block work, especially when he had Joe Lapone driving. Okay, okay, that's what I want to clarify. So we're on the right page. When when they switched to five hundred cubic inches is when him and I uh, started having conversations, and yeah. then uh, he would call me up and pick my mind, and then uh, uh, but only later did I did I do complete complete projects for them okay so that has to be 82 and above because that's when they went to the big block 500 right. cubic inch rule in 82 so okay that's cool so How uh before then uh, uh i was in southern california until until uh, 81 and moved to uh carson city nevada uh, okay and um i I, I didn't I don't do any local work other than a few friends and so uh, uh, all my work was strictly IHRA pro stock NHRA pro stock I had an offshore contract with Merck Cruiser and and wow. I did some NASCAR Wow and yeah. drag boat racing which is popular on the west coast where was the double short turn you told me about the, the double short turn evolved I uh, back in the pound per cubic inch days, yep. um, uh, Warren was uh, getting involved with Ozenbill, and we we're working on uh, small block Ozenbill projects. Okay, and and uh, I found that they Ozenbill made two different 350 castings. They made a 330, a 350, with two different short turns in it. One where the port literally goes to the valve bowl and then makes a right angle turn and enters the motor. And then it has another one where the port goes in kind of uphill and then uh, an inch and a half away from the valve bowl, it, it slopes downhill where to the smaller valve that was in the head originally, okay. it was literally knife edge. And so when you open it up, we put the 455 valves in it. I had a, a head program that I would put the, early 350 heads on the 403 Pontiac Firebirds that had okay. Oldsmobile engines in them. Okay. And and you'd go out the head bolts, but that was worth 60 horsepower with a head change. Really? Wow. Yeah. So we put the 455 valves in it. Yep. We put the same rocker gear, same camshaft, everything. It, you didn't know it was any different other than it went a lot faster. And that had a double braking short turn. And when I got into, most people don't know, Warren ran a small block Ozenbilt and NHRA. I never knew that. Yeah. And so uh, um, he ran an Ozenbilt Starfire, which was a Vega type car. Yeah, I see. I can see it. Aster was another car like that, I think. Right. So we, uh, I found that I, I, I couldn't get the, the, the flow curves right. Uh, if you, when you tried to get the flow numbers, everything went turbulent. So I went back and kind of looked at the the cast iron heads that I did before, and and I kept looking at it and looking at it. And uh, um, you had to get underneath the spring pad, and you had to get some volume, but you had to get over the short turn. And I thought, well, let me try that. So I I did a double braking short turn where the short turn enters brakes oh an inch and a half back from the port slopes downhill and then it's got a smaller short turn at the seat 
Okay. I can kind of see it in my mind's eye, what you're saying, you know? Well, it, 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 it really just made the small block goes bill come alive. It, it far outflowed small block Chevrolets, including the latest and greatest at the time, the turbo castings and all those. Really? Because I had those. Yeah. Nice. Oh, by a bunch. Wow. Well, a small block, the reason is small block board spacing is four inch 400 and a Olsenville small block is, um, let's see, four, four, it's, uh, four, six, 25, four and five eights. So you could get bigger boards, bigger yeah. valves, more, more valve unshrouding and everything. Yeah. That's amazing. It, and so, uh, um. We modified the core boxes on aluminum Mosville heads and uh, uh, made it, made a few. In fact, I probably got one or two pieces still still on the shelf that you know are probably worthy of a picture or two. Well, you you know we said about all that old stuff. I'm the guy. So well, I we'll make some cool videos. Most everything I do is I, I I do design head and a sample head that we copy and everything else and we compare everything to and and i pretty much have all the original designs and samples that uh, uh, and and my marketing at the time is i only came out with a new cylinder head every year i was not in this constant update mode okay. i would come out with something like everybody came out with a new car and then you made it the rest of the year and sold it and uh and I would work with people like Warren and Jenkins and everybody else to learn and then and then put that all in a new head in in the fall of the year after the world finals. Now, is that when you so, started working with Brodix about then or were you doing a different foundry? Well, I uh, I worked with Brodex. Uh, uh, I was doing the Pontiac Pro Stock head that based on a Brodex casting. And uh, um, so. Uh, in the Pontiac line, we we were the fastest guys out there by a, by far, and and so um, they talked to me about doing my own cylinder headline. So uh, uh, I took everything that I knew and came up with a uh, what we called an EV series, which was basically a pro stock concept that was developed in different cubic inches. They had different port cores. Okay. Same outside jacket, yeah. different port cores, chamber cores, and valve guide placements, but basically uh, all, all based off the same casting, which which they went for. So we had uh, a big bore uh, small stroke that we ran on the world's fastest streetcar, which uh, Spiro, uh, Pappas. Spiro Pappas. Yeah, I remember was, that. Well, he, had, and yellow he had those the EB420s, and then we made a 498 which was basically a pro stock head. And then we made a, a 560 and then we made a, a, um, a four, 900 four space space, which we called an EB 600. Okay. Yeah. I remember and that. So, Camaro. Wow. And, um, it had better rocker gear on it, better, uh, more installed height. So you could put the latest and greatest valve springs on it. It had a lot of advantages over buying a, a, a Pontiac head. Okay. And uh, and then um, Maskins, uh, uh, who who, um, who has passed away now, yep. who uh, owned, owned Dart. Uh, sure. He uh, he actually copied my uh, Pontiac Pro Stock head, and and because it's Pontiac, he made the Big Chief Pontiac. <laughs> so so the Big Chief is a copy of your cylinder head. The big chief, yeah, was basically a copy of my my uh, uh, pro stock Pontiac head. Wow. Okay. Same court <laughs> spacing, same yep. valve guide locations. Different names uh, on the outside. <laughs> yeah, he he changed the rocker gear around some for ease of manufacturing. It was enough different to be different, but flow wise and performance wise, the big chief head was was um, a Eight. Well, we can say it was a copy. You know, he did things yeah. differently, but sure. the, the, what what made him run was the same. Well, let me ask you this: Now that we're talking about Maskins, so I, I heard a story from a guy um, who told me that 
they were running aluminum blocks and heads in pro stock in the mid 70s. Am I right? Um, I did. You I worked with some people we ran aluminum block in it. But it was but, but it was put off as cast iron, am I right? Uh, Passed no, off. you could run aluminum block uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 our experience with the aluminum blocks, uh, we had uh, uh, a a modified production Corvette from uh, a friend that in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, he uh, he had a, an aluminum block, and it was a um, a real 427 aluminum block. And those are scarcer than hen's teeth, but we ran one of that just to get the car weight down. But there's no real performance advantage to the aluminum block back then because we needed as much bore as we could get. Okay. And with an aluminum block, you, you you just couldn't run the big bore with the sleeves. Right. It just wouldn't hold up. Okay. But they so, were running, like Maskins, I heard he casted the aluminum blocks for AMC back in the day. I, I don't I don't know who, who did the blocks. I was involved in the AMC IndyCar program. Okay. But those were those were small motors with and with with and I know the heads were cast. Uh, I don't know who cast the AMC heads, uh, um, but they did have the uh, um, the 400 inch part numbers on them. But they had the 290 combustion chambers in them. Okay. They were they were kind of hogged together, you know. Part of the core of this one, part of the core of that one. They were they were pretty sloppily done, with, you know, hard to machine. But wow, that's why that's why he got the job. <laughs> Do you remember seeing his, I think it's Maskin's head that he cut, he transected it across to raise it up and welded it back together to make it taller. Do you remember that? Yeah. 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 He, um, um, furnace braced it, uh, uh, two, two heads. Yeah. That, I thought that was, I thought that was a marvelous idea. It's amazing, man. Back then. God. So that's, that's why they had the head height, head created a head height rule. And this is this is what John Wilburn said, and I've heard this before. Maskin cast whatever part number he wanted on it. <laughs> well, I, I heard that. <laughs> I I I heard that rumor too. I uh, I don't know. So but, when uh, you let's say you're doing work with Gruppy in the big block era, what yes. kind of what kind of combinations was he running? You know, four versus stroke. You know, what heads. What was he cooking out? How much horsepower do you think um, he was making? I don't know what kind of power he made. Uh, uh, I really got involved in his program when when GM, when the Chevrolet came out with their symmetrical port big block. Yep. And uh, um, I got I got a piece of the casting from the foundry. And he asked me what I thought, and I said, it's a catastrophe. <laughs> uh, and, and the one you buy out of the box is a catastrophe. So, uh, uh, so he got me a couple of raw castings and after 40 hours of welding and everything else, I made it, you know, a graceable part. And so I told him what they flowed. And, uh, so, uh, um, we panicked, we panicked the set together for him, uh, from summertime when we first got him and he ran him at, uh, in Arizona just before the world finals and reset the national record. Wow. With Joe, with Joe Cohen driving, something brand new, never been run. Totally new concept. Wow. So I, I, I was impressed. And, and then uh, um, uh, at the World Finals, Warren Johnson reset the national record. So the, uh, I remember uh, uh, walking through the pits and Jenkins walking up to me and he says, you did bring your order book, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jenkins was a card. He was, he was a smart guy. Was he grumpy? Pardon? Was he grumpy? Um, not if you did what you said you're going to do. He, was, he had a <laughs> okay. gruffness about it. He was, he was, he would huff and puff when he talked to him. Uh, uh, you know. Short guy too. Yeah. Well, the, um, Joe Lapone come walking across the pits and he says, a grump wants to talk to you. He says, he says, 
He says he's going to want to walk over to the trailer and step up in the doorway. He says, why don't you see how long you can keep him away from the doorway before he can't step up and look you in the eye? So what happened? He did exactly that. He walked. When I was talking to him, he kept walking over close to the trailer and stepped up in the doorway. <laughs> so, and Joe Lapone, he was, he was, he was just chortling. He was having, he was having a good, good time out. So, but he, he, uh, he always treated me excellent, but I, I didn't make any promises I couldn't deliver. So okay. I guess that's why we got along. Somebody's asked me, they said, ask Larry about his early days with his Camaro down in the San Fernando Valley, big block dominator finger. Well, headers, I think Doug Nash, five speed sound familiar. Well, I didn't have a Camaro. I had a 57 Corvette. Okay. Maybe that's what he means. Doug Nash, five speed. Yeah. There Doug you go. Nash, five speed. Um, uh, I, uh, in 1975, uh, I uh, um, won class at Pomona, got me a Wally. Nice. So, uh, yeah, that, that was, and uh, I ran a 287 with turbo heads on it. And to make it run, really have a, a much better power, had a 100 short rod in it. I was picking up on what Cleveland, what they did on the Cleveland Fords. You know, big port, shorter rods, that 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 seemed to pan out real well. And, uh, um, but... I actually, I actually took my brand new Doug Nash five speed and I cleaned third gear, t- tore the teeth off it. Ooh. Dang, with a 287. Man. With a 287. Wow. So, but I, uh, I, I did things back in 75. I had at the world's best bow springs, I had uh, Chrysler battleship springs, which were inch and five eighths on a small block. Nobody did that. And I turned the thing to the moon before rev limiters, you just push the pedal all the way down and it'd go up 10,000 and let the clutch out. <coughs> wow. That's what that I heard. was 1975. Um, Did drop the clutch at 95 or 10 grand, you know? Yeah. Well, I had a 650 gear in the car and a five wow. speed. So, you know, it didn't go very far, but it sure moved good. What's up, Andy from Unity uh, Motorsports? I, uh, I want to ask you this question. What do you think from your experience and what you remember now that we're on Glidden and the Cleveland Pro Stock? I think his best combination that he liked was 343 cubic inch, 342, that 340 cubic inch range. Any comment on, you know, big bore, short stroke type stuff? You were mentioning that. What can you well, enlighten the, us? The, the, the big bore, uh, uh, the, the advantage is, is, is just better breathing. You could just put more valve area. Okay. Okay. And, uh, uh, the like the uh, um, Pat Musi when he won Indy and set the national record the last year in pounds per cubic inch. Okay, that was a big block um, design like a Cleveland Ford. That I think the motor was only three sixty two, and I actually took the valves and moved them closer together and put an inch and five eighths exhaust valve in it and uh, welded up the chambers and and we built it much like a Cleveland and uh, it was it was fast. Wow. So most people don't know that was uh, he was the fastest pounds per, per inch car out there. I didn't know that. Uh, when we, we talked, uh, we decided if he can't if he can't beat them Fords, join them. I remember him, Spiro Pappas, back in the fastest streetcar stuff. He had Popeye, the green Camaro. I mean, that's when I was really getting into the heaviness in the 90s. And, yeah, uh, yeah. With Pro Stock and this fastest street stuff. Yeah, that was that was my EB series head. I had I had quite a number of, of cars out there running that series. And, and really, you, you could buy a, a complete set of heads with rocker arms, all ported. I mean, literally ready to race in a manifold for under ten thousand dollars. Wow, that's a steal. <laughs> and we're talking front runner. So, but um, do you do you back think in, back back in the days of the pounds per cubic inch stuff? I spent a lot of time in IHRA racing. I I literally had every qualified car in the field at certain races. Wow, they all had so, your heads. And. Uh, my my best car running was 
uh, Lee Edwards, General Lee. Wow, I do remember him. And uh, it was Lee Edwards, uh, Pat Musi, yep. uh, um, Sonny Leonard was there. Yeah. He was raising pro stuff. Yep. And uh, uh, so I made a lot of trips to the East Coast and did the uh, IHRA thing. And uh, when they switched over to 500 inches, uh, because most of those motors were still, you know, just over 500 inches. So, so uh, uh, it became pretty easy to step into 500 inches. Okay. And uh, a lot of it was just actually designing a motor and, and camshafts and manifolds to get the car down the racetrack. So a lot of, a lot of things we did uh, um, was to change the power curve, uh, take torque away from the bottom and try to expend the, extend the RPM range of the motor and manifolding and everything else. Even though the numbers didn't fit, the cars went faster. And it probably helped to take away some of that low end so they got better traction, yeah. you know? Yeah. Because they were like a... Yeah, I, I had a hell of a time convincing Warren that uh, uh, I had short manifolds on three other cars and they were going considerably faster. But Warren was the torque king. He loved the torque, so... So you're saying the platinum, the runners of the platinum were shorter. The runners were shorter, brought the platinum closer. Right. Okay. Which seems to be, that, that seems to be what's more popular now. It kind of went from the tall high rise, and as things got faster, they got shorter and closer. Am I right? Right. Okay. So we, we found that we can make the motor so powerful down low that, uh, especially to camshaft technology, big core camshafts, uh, 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 short cam timing and, and, uh, um, and a tremendous lift. Uh, um, some of the projects I worked on, we had one inch 200 lift in it. Wow. So, like, like for example, Pat Musi's whatever he ran a 632 or whatever cubic inch it was, how much volume are those intake runners? I mean, are they like 300 C, you know, 300 CCs? Are they, you know, 400, what, what size volume are those things on well, that car? You know, uh, uh, one of the things I never did is I never CC port runners because I found that piece of information useless on my stuff. But, but don't, to try to get it perfectly the same, you don't care about that. Then you just do it by eye and say, Hey, there we are. Let's roll. No, all my stuff measures the same because I would machine all the ports. So you weren't using a grinder. Well, well, everybody else was porting. I, I machined the ports. That's why my stuff was so consistent. I actually, before CNC machines, I actually had fixture plates that I had master heads that I would plot cutters off of and, and manually machine them and, and do each wall uh, one step at a time and, and do four pairs of heads. So I do eight, 10 castings and all one cut. And then I changed the cut, yep. but it, would, it was done uh, on a manual bridge port before CNC's. That's why they're all consistent. Everything always flowed the same. Wow. Okay. See, I never knew any of that. No one's, I bet you the guys on here don't even know that. that that's no, a, I, you, yeah. I, the, well, I see a lot of people do, you know, that they, they work like hell on one port and it flows great, but the rest of the head's junk. They can't copy their own work. It's is it it's hard, that hard to replicate unless you're really good. You're saying, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I had um, eight porters. I had fifteen people. I had eight porters and and two stars. Two guys. Two guys that had an eye on that were deadly. Wow. So, eight porters. You had eight people machining those heads. Yeah. That's I had cool, fifteen man. people. Wow. So, and uh, yeah, so uh, uh, and we we put our own seats in. Uh, the other thing that 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 I did, uh, I uh, uh, that we found was important was getting the valve guide clearance right. We we would run valve guide clearances. If you hone them, you can run them at seven or eight tenths. Seven or that eight way the valve tenths. 
tens of a thousand. Yes, less than a thousand sky clearance. Wow. And then, and then to make them even even tougher, we put steel guides in the heads. Instead of bronze, they they, they were bronze coated steel guides because we found out that at high speed, the, the the valves were wobbling and beating up the valve job. And the other thing that I would get other people's work in it, they they couldn't get the valve job in two cylinders is pain you, you know whether i was right or wrong they're all the same they're all within five thousandths on height and the run out was within two tenths okay so you know um we machine all the valve jobs in get all that and then we would go back and and touch everything with with uh, uh old-fashioned way with a stone and and bring them in we'd leave them a little wide because everything moves a little bit so we left them a little wide so it, the next valve job always had enough material to make it even better. So, wow, yeah, that, that's amazing. Someone's so, asking, but that was just a standard that we had. Uh, wow. As standard, uh, certain people uh, um, had uh, 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 Jenkins had, uh, uh, Musi had, uh, uh, Warren certainly had. He was he was a stickler about it, uh, and um, so. You kind of get used to working in that parameter, and uh, that's just the standard of the day. So let's use Warren Johnson, for example. So when you were affiliated with him, you did the head work and the intake work, right? Probably more head work than intake work. Oh, okay. I, I did I did a lot of scratch manifolds, especially in the beginning where, where we had wine cast bases with sheet metal tops on them. Yep. Okay. And, and then hybrid. And then as we got into the DRC, DRCE stuff, he started getting into his own. He had his own castings, his own manifold castings. And so he would, as as he kept developing, it was easier for him to do it himself. But I was involved in the the original road, roll deck concept. I don't know if you've heard that term, but roll that was a deck. concept that I developed and and Warren and I took off on when nobody was looking. What, what was it? Roll deck? R O L L D E C K? Yes. Roll deck. No, I have no idea what that is. Can you enlighten us? Well, the NHRA had a head height rule, but the valve cover on a big box Chevrolet is sloped. So I welded up the, the head surface in a wedge. And, and out at the intake surface, I added a half an inch. And then at the short exhaust bolt holes, I cut a hundred thousandths off, and I just twisted the head. Yeah. Slid it, slid it up on the block. So when you looked at the head bolt holes on the top, they look like they're in a stock location, but they're actually slotted on the bottom. <laughs> that moved the intake valve up up above center line of the board, which gave the valve more valve to board clearance, which gave me more flow, more flow number. Wow. So you're actually changing the degree of the head? You yes. Know, you know what I mean? Instead of being like a 23 degree Chevy, whatever they are, you're changing right. that to a different degree. Am I right? More zero. Two degrees. Yeah, you rotate the head two degrees, and then yep. later we we rotated it more, and then we rotated the valves. I mean, Jesus, I think about that. It's like, how much work is involved with that? And what do you pick up? 20 horsepower? 15 horsepower? What? Oh, well, 20, 30. Okay. Okay. When you and you rotate the valves, we would rotate the, the head two degrees, three degrees, we'd rotate the valves. And and rotating the valves is the reason why today they have run one eight fifty length rockers, uh, uh, because we we could couldn't reach from the push rod to the valve tip. So we had to put longer rockers on it. Okay. So because yeah, one degree over that long a valve, uh, uh you know, all of a sudden that tip of the valve moves a quarter of an inch. So you, it was. Quick question. Right? Well, I'm reading some of these comments. Do you think that, you know, I had asked Darren Morgan the same question. He answered. So I kind of want to get your thoughts on it. Do you think the Cleveland cylinder head was like the basis of pro stock heads? Um. I, I, I think the Cleveland had uh, set the pace. Okay. And, I'm good and, with that. And there was two Cleveland heads. You know, there 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 was a a 
Cleveland had uh, uh, that had press in press in guides, freestanding bronze press in guides, and rolls like like the FE. Uh, I, I don't know anything about it. It's, it was for the Trans Am series. Okay. Those yes. Those were even better flowing. That that was better than all the all the store store bought stuff and the drag race stuff. And I worked on I worked on that project. It was a uh, a, a Trans Am project, Trans Am 302 Cleveland. Okay, I've seen them with I've seen Cleveland's with a small block Chevy exhaust port before. That yeah. pattern. You know, talking that. talking to Glidden, you know, I asked him, "What do you think the race plate gave the Cleveland Ford?" And and you know, I was surprised. I I think it only gave twenty five or maybe twenty horsepower. Yep. 20, 25 horses, what I heard. Yeah, it it was, um, and uh, the uh, I did a bunch of uh, uh, Cleveland Fords for some NASCAR racers. I would pin the deck, yeah, and 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 bronze weld up the exhaust ports and raise the port up so it wasn't any bigger, but it was raised a half an inch. So you 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 pin the um, the intake port, the, the so it wouldn't flex. The seat wouldn't flex. You're saying through the water jacket. Is that yeah, what you're you there's you can pin the deck. You can actually drill through the head surface. Okay. And and there's spots uh, underneath the corners of the intake port. You can spot face them and and put uh, hardened threaded right. bolts. Yeah. Is what I use. Okay. And and screw them in and lock tie them in, and and you can stitch the deck uh, around because. Uh, they're notorious for blowing head gaskets. Yep, yep. That's how that's how we fixed the Clevelands. <clears throat> Did Bob do all of his own? Because I'll tell you, and I told you this before, that's how I figured out why he was the fastest compared to everybody is because he welded up his combustion chamber just like a modern-day combustion chamber today. He was doing that back in 76 and 77, maybe even right. before then. And that added, Darren Morgan told me, 40 foot-pounds of torque just with that combustion chamber shape. Am I right? Right. He was doing that, wasn't he? I, well, we we one of the first projects that I really did a lot of combustion chamber welding on was the Pat Musi project because we took a four and a quarter four head and we made it a four and an eighth and moved all the valve guides. So I, I welded all the radiuses and all the chambers uh, to give you an idea that in a, in my store bought big block Chevrolet pro stock style head. Yep. I welded up all the radiuses in that, and where you would mill ahead, maybe to 108 cc's, uh, uh, and that's when you put it right down to the intake seats. Yep, yep. You you mill my head to the intake seats, and it's 97. Shut the door. Shut the door. Wow. With the same wow. with the same piston in it. Yep. Machine. So, wow. and that's because because I redid all the corner radiuses and and. And I lined the exhaust valve pocket that overhangs the bore. I lined it up with the bore. I slid the head over. I did all kinds of mechanical things that everybody jumps on a float bench without thinking about the mechanics. I did more mechanical things to make them flow sometimes than, than with a grinder. Wow. It's amazing. So what do you think? A lot of it's, a lot of it's the mechanics. Uh, um, uh, Back around 2000, I worked with some Ford racers. I know you're a little Ford oriented. I yeah. I did I did some uh, uh, I think a Super Stock B, um, a 427 Mustang, and uh, uh, put 40 horsepower in his car. Uh, um, and uh, one of the things I did because I had worked on the SK. 427 heads, the Canadian 427 heads yeah. that had rural seats. I took and I bored and sleeved the intake bowls on 427 head and turned them into more of an SK style cylinder head. Let, let me stop you there. Now, what you're talking about is when the they Ford won the Indy, the Nationals with a Canadian 428 head. Is that what you're talking about? Right. Yeah, they actually changed the they casted a whole separate set of heads like 10 different heads that they put on the right. race cars that were different right that's what you're talking about right and and next to the exhaust ports it's got the letters sk 
Yes, I know what SK is for Ford Special. Right. Well, product. that's how you could. Uh, a, a car that's in the Ford Museum called Starshine is 64 um, Fairlane, uh, uh, who is a close friend of mine. He passed away. His car's in the Ford, Ford Museum. It, had a, it has a pair of SK. the shape of the seats because it has roll seats in it and they used the roll seats in the sk head they used them in the high risers and yeah. they used them in a few of the 351 cleveland and uh, um and Hi, all we know is when we if we took the if we took the uh, did a normal valve job on an sk head lost 30 horsepower wow so that's dreadful so i took and I, I, I float a bunch of 428 heads and I bored the valve holes oh, an inch deep and I had some valve seat material and I pressed it in and, and I rough shaped it in a lathe and pressed it in and right up to the bottom of the valve job because NHRA had a rule about changing seats. So I ran it up to the bottom of the 30 degree seat and put the SK valve job in it. <laughs> This is so stuff I've, I've only I've read about it. stories, I've, and you're I've telling me you're the guy that did it. Heads smaller. Oh, it's amazing. And uh, the guy, the, the, I mean, he he reset the national record at the time, and uh, uh, the the thing is, he brought me a basket full of cylinder heads uh, from all the popular people, and every every time I gra grabbed a head that was ported even more, it flowed less. I was I was really shocked, and uh, uh, so. I, I started out with some virtually stock ones that somebody had diddled with and 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 did that and uh, um, went out there and went fast and uh, and uh, then I uh, in the in the Ford world one of my local friends uh, he ran ran a M stock automatic a two eighty nine Comet okay and uh, back then uh, we made him a national record holder with a two eighty nine dang man <laughs> that's so, crazy. And those are those are super stockers where where you couldn't at the time you couldn't do any chamber work or anything right and he had about 30 pairs of heads and i found out that if you measure the heads correctly you could find that they there's a group of heads that have the chambers off cast in the right direction and then and then i board and sleeve the intake guides and move the intake valves off the cylinder wall about fifteen thousandths, and you could do that as long as you had it pair of heads with that never had a valve job wow i just this Another, stuff blows me away hearing this because that was back in the day we're not talking like you know five years ago you're talking back in 70. well yeah we're yeah. we're talking 80s and 90s oh, okay. all the way up to 2000 uh, uh, because of that you had to run factory castings and 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 you were very limited that you couldn't touch the combustion chambers uh, uh they uh um uh, but you'd look at these heads and uh, you could compare them to stock and unless you're a, you had some fine tools you couldn't find what was different now when you so, move that valve angle or change it in a cast iron head are you just changing the sleeve location you know the guide i mean moving it over are you welding up the original Guide well, on the cast iron heads, we didn't weld them in the super stockers. We we simply uh, uh, offset board them and put okay. 502 guides in them. Okay, that's what I wondered. Okay. 502 okay. steel guides that were uh, uh, bronze lined. Okay. Just, you know, just the regular auto parts store valve guide thing. That's what it looked like. Wow. But but when you, when you go from 1130 seconds to to uh 502 you know you know you know we we just seem to miss the number all the time on purpose <laughs> have you I ever mean, moving valve guides in 289 heads that was a half a day project wow really yeah so you know and uh but but when you move the guides you know in a super stock 289 you put 10 horsepower in a 289 I mean, that's a, that's a lot. And, uh, 
So a lot of it was just changing the mechanics. I was as much as changing the mechanics, the rocket geometry, and, and, and all those things that I was uh, uh, porting. I, I never thought that I was a better porter than anybody else, but I, I was a lot smarter on the placement of the valves and the chambers and chamber shapes and things like that. I think that was my real edge. Well, that's what you told me. The advantage, not just the flow numbers, but it's the rocker arm ratio, the rocker arm geometry that really makes a big difference in an engine. Uh, well, it makes a lot of difference, especially uh, uh, when you want a high RPM. Uh, uh, the the nobody, the rock arms and the camshaft manufacturers still aren't talking. Uh, uh, they're, I'm, I, I, I plot that stuff and, and, and I look at it and it's, you know, I think that's a big, uh, big place for improvement. Uh, probably uh, uh, Greg Anderson is the one that probably has spent more time on it than anybody that I know. Really? Now yeah. he was he was Warren Johnson's crew chief, right? He was his crew chief at one time. Yeah. Okay. Then he left and went on his own. Right. And uh, um, he he got he got a guy to back him with some money and. Uh, uh, he moved over into into the NASCAR world, and the guy that runs I don't remember which NASCAR team, uh, but run uh, that run the Spintron. I think they had four or five Spintrons, and he was really knowledgeable. He went over and held his hand on setting up the rocket geometry. And in fact, he called me a, a couple of times because I knew who he was, and I would go, "Oh well, well that's not fair." Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so. So and and he came out of the box going fast because he he could simply spin his motor higher than everybody else. That was back in you know rev it as high as you could. And, uh, we were we were looking at rocket geometry that would go with over an inch of lift go twelve thousand RPM. Wow, I can't even imagine that. I know it's it's crazy, but and uh, um, that's when we got into calculating valve weights and kinetic energies and all all those things that you did by hand when I did it. Now you can buy some programs, but, okay. uh, you know, the computer has is, is kind of taken over that world. But, you know, somebody's still got to think about it before they go to the computer. There, there's, there's two things I want to say. First, and you don't have to get into a long discussion. It could be a yes or no. But just adding titanium valves to your valve train, beneficial? versus expense well it's if price is not not the object right. yes 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 valve titanium valves have much more valve control it, assuming that it's not too endurance oriented yes right, uh, right. titanium valves uh, are, are always should be the choice okay. especially if you've got a roller camshaft what's a recommendation on a steel valve rpm limit is there a limit to you in your mind um yeah, lots of big block Chevrolets that I did. You know, I, I, I had a kind of a, a bracket racing series, and uh, um, I would I would say, you know, uh, 700 lift and 7,000 RPM. 700 lift? 7,000 RPM. Okay, okay. As long as you didn't, you didn't break those two numbers, you're not going to, you're not going to break a valve. Here's because one 700 lift. You're, you're not going to buy a camshaft with ramp speeds that throws throw the valve in the orbit. No, I've ran, I ran with a stock Cleveland valves, 8,200 going through the traps for like five years. Yeah. On that thing, never had a bit of problem. Well, and, as long as you have really good valve springs. Tool room, Isky tool room, I thought were a great brand at that time. Yeah. So, and, and it, the, the thing is, is you've got to really control steel valves, but if the average store-bought valve springs and everything else, yeah. uh, uh, that's, and uh, I think I think we're 7.7 seven and 7.700 seven, pound open pressure. All good numbers for you guys to, to pay attention to. Now get so, this, Larry. Yeah. This is from LSX Concepts. You ever hear of that company? LSX Concepts? Yeah, you ever hear of them? Oh, yeah. Okay, here's what they say. Want to hear a good story? Ask Larry about putting a tent in Warren Johnson's car, porting the heads in the hotel parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> that, 
That was actually a small block Bozeman bill. And that Starfire. That was, that was yeah. the debut with this with the Starfire, and uh, um, uh, I had a sample head with different port configurations, and we and and we had three camshafts. So we we went there with the more torque torque oriented stuff. Yep. Uh, because you can you can fix too much torque, but if you don't have torque, you've got nothing to fix. Got it. Got it. So, so we went out there and run and blew the tires off, and the car was uh, um, unruly. And uh, so, uh, and it didn't qualify. So we brought it back, and we were in a. And he was still a budget racer at the time. Uh, uh, we went back to the motel and it, with a bunch of super stock racers, and we yarded the heads off. And I'm porting the heads uh, off the on on the on a ramp a car ramp and he's changing the camshafts inside the, the thing and this is in columbus ohio we sweat like pigs yep but uh, uh so we did all that and went out there and ran it and we ran a tenth faster <laughs> <laughs> then we did it we did it again and we put another tenth in the car and Jesus. then and then after he qualified uh, uh which was unheard of uh you know all, this is all brand new stuff uh, uh never been on a dyno and um we're just playing it by the seat of our pants and it rained and the race got rained out wow so did you ever run that combination yeah he okay. ran it a few times more but uh he didn't have a chance he he was um he was contracted with jerome bradford out of atlanta uh, um, a big contractor of some sort to run an ihra jerome bradford car so he he was doing the small block in his in, in his own time when he had moved from um minnesota to atlanta okay and uh so so we we did the two cars and the drone bradford we we'd run those ihra races and we ran some ahra races where they ran the nitrous small blocks against the big motor stuff i do remember that so, yeah and um you know, paid the bills. Still had to work for a living. <laughs> My God, man, it's crazy to hear these stories. You know. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, um, it for yeah for a number of years, it it was an easy race in NHRA Pro Stock. Not a lot of money in it. It, you know, if you didn't have a big money backer and and if you didn't perform well, uh, it was really tough. You better have a big wallet because it it was tough. I I gotta say that you know. Um, between the, uh, uh, I know uh, Bob Glidden, uh, uh, my friends used to call him Mad Dog because he worked so hard. Yes. And he and, had a temper, uh, to, temper too, they say, you know. And and Warren was the same way. He, uh, he, he'd be up at six, be working on a car at seven, and, and, and nine o'clock at night, you know, he says, that's enough. <laughs> I, I can remember changing the combination. We... We put uh, a clutchless car uh, in for Indy, going to test it after we qualified. We put it on the, the second day, and uh, um, we got done changing the clutch and putting the clutchless in. Uh, got done at 5 o'clock in the morning, took a shower, and went back to the racetrack. Wow. So, well, you had to win to eat, basically, back then, I bet. And uh, it was, but that's how you learn that's that's it was it was um trying to fi figure it all out how did you yeah. get someone asked this and i'm kind of getting back into the questions how did you get into racing or porting racing cylinder heads i mean you didn't work at like you know mcdonald's and say well one day i'm going to go and start porting cylinder heads like did you start on the lawnmower the dirt bike the tractor something well i uh i was uh can I say this? I I was a street racer too. At one there time. it is. Nice. And uh, I had a 2,800 pound 57 Corvette with uh, an L88 in it. Nice. It was it was a 10 second car in the street. And that back was what year? Early, back in the early 70s. Okay. So. And. Um, I turned it into an NHRA car with with a 287, and it still ran 10. So, um, but I, I did that, and I was going to college. I went to a, a college uh, 
to take uh, um, um, computer classes, uh, and uh, which was my main endeavor, uh, was supposed to be. And uh, I got a job at Valley Head Services as a swamper and worked my way up to manager. And so I started meeting a few people. And uh, when the economy got really bad, somebody advised uh, the owner of Valley Head Service, well, keep your workers to lay off the high price spread. So uh, he let me go at Christmas. And, uh, I went to Pomona, uh, which is in February, and everybody says, where are you at? And I have been out of job since. Now, that was Larry O'Freya, right? He owned Valley High yeah. Service, right? Right. Bill Fiority told me that, and I kind of knew that, too. I was, I've was i been reading about Larry just so I could kind of get a prepare. It's hard to prepare what you're going to say when you're talking to someone with this kind of vast experience. To me, yeah. sitting here in my little garage, so. <laughs> he, uh, yeah, he he had he had a great shop. I, I like, when I was there, I actually learned how to port uh, uh, by uh, uh, Timmy Hogan of Hogan's, Hogan's Manifold. Yeah. You were saying so, that. That's amazing. And uh, uh, so I took over the porting room and flow bench work, and then I got in. I got into t- doing all the phone work and working with the professional racers. And sure. uh, so when I left, they followed me. Nice. And uh, so, you know what? And uh, I was I was even shocked. I didn't expect that when I went to Pomona. They uh, they literally just sent me parts. I I had my I, I had my own. Corvette that I was in a cherry race in a little little shop and and uh, I, I never looked back I I uh, um, put in my shop I I I did a lot I had some machinery so I, I would do machine work for the other head shops <laughs> in the San Fernando Valley and uh, which were quite a few at the time so um, so they were subbing out to you for I don't know what valve moving valve locations or whatever what what kind of stuff would you oh, do we, we weren't that sophisticated okay. mostly it was angle milling and yep. correcting intake faces and, and uh, fixing bolt holes i did a lot of a lot of repair work i because i could i could weld and and i and i had seat guide machine i could put seats in and and i i did a lot of repair work people blew a lot of stuff up so that's where i i figured out how to weld and and, and cosmetically make it make it make it look like the welded stuff look better than the cast stuff Man, I sure wish you were still into port and heads. I have a nice set of aluminum A3 Ford Cleveland heads you'd probably have fun with. <laughs> so uh, to tell you the truth, I, I I like the engineering part, but I hated the porting part. That's why I had so many porters. Okay. I, and and uh, uh, one of one of my best guys is still doing cylinder heads. So who's that? Yep. Um, his name's Danny. Okay. What's and, up, uh, Danny? If you're watching this, good to see you. And uh, um, so he uh, he he does a lot of private work. So uh, and he's a Ford guy. So hey, maybe we better hook up with him. Well, um, uh, um, I'll send you over his number. Uh, yep. Um, I'll I'll talk to him first. So perfect. I always got and, something uh, I gotta build or get something done. Yeah, he's he's an excellent craftsman. Uh, I. I've been lucky to work with some really smart people and some excellent craftsmen. So, um, how how did you come about? You told me about this, and I put it on the description about a Fioro head. Like they were going to have the Fioro Pontiac Fioro be the pace car, right? Right. And then it couldn't make enough power or something to keep up with the, the NASCAR, the regular racers. So you had to recast the head or something. It, they were debuting it in, in IndyCar race, and. It, and the, the pace laps, they didn't have enough poop to stay in front of the pace laps for the Indy cars. He <laughs> couldn't leave the pits and drive out and get in front of them. <laughs> and uh, I was trying to remember who was running the program. Uh, John Callies of Callies Cranks. Yes. He was, in, he was in charge of that program. And he called me up and said, we got to fix this problem. And I was working on a secret project for Norman Palmer that we went out there and destroyed Comp Eliminator with a Pontiac. Uh, uh, I told them what they had, well, I remember now, but there was a comparable with V8. And uh, he says, how much? And he shuddered at the price. And he says, I needed them yesterday. And 
I says, you get me castings. I had them on my board, doorstep the following morning. So I realized they were in a panic. I sent them out. He, he flowed them. He was happy as a lark, and everything worked out the way they wanted. So That's amazing. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, they <laughs> imagine uh, trying to debut a car that would get run over by race cars on a pace lap. Oh, yeah, and only having probably a month to get it ready, you know, when they call you. Oh, I, yeah. Well, yeah, I was right in the middle of my busiest season, and I told them, I says, I said, you know, I'm going to have to my work my guy's weekends. And, uh, um, and I tried to not work them too hard because it's a hard job. And uh, um, so I, I took a couple of people and uh, um, um, we did them up. But I did those out of raw castings too. Most everything I did, I started with raw castings. Jesus. I, I saw a set of those E460 heads as a raw casting. It's like, where do you start? You know? Wow. I actually, I actually have the book on, on how to, how to machine them. Oh, there's a book on it. Yeah, I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> there it is, so, guys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, every, every setup to do every hole, every, every datum point. So, yeah, where to, where to dog off the castings. So, because I, I designed it all. I know where all the dog points are. And, uh, um, so. What other heads did, today, did you design? Today it's a lot easier with CNC. Oh, yeah. What other heads did you design? Well, I did. Uh, uh, like not race stuff. I, I developed with Warren the DRC head. Yep. Uh, uh, when NHRA said said the Ozebill run, so we we jumped on an Ozebill project uh, uh, the day after the World Finals when they gave the stamp of approval, and uh, we did those, and then uh, uh, the uh, Dodge Boys. Uh, uh, I work with the Dodge Boys and Brodax developing a a Dodge head that's was the paired core head like a like a small block Chevrolet. Wow, to, really? to flow as good as anything else. So, uh, um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, and those those castings were all hands great cores. You start out with the cores and where you want extra material, they just knock the dirt away. I think those heads started off at seventy or eighty pounds in aluminum. Wow! And by the time you're done, so, you get twenty five pounds. <laughs> yeah. So, and you and when you get done, they weigh. 35 pounds, oh. 30, 35. So, but yeah, uh, but for example, uh, uh, on the early heads, the oil drain backs were drilled through the width of the valve cover rails. So you had no place else to put drain backs in it. So we drill, drill holes from the, through the valve cover rails down to the, the, the lifter chamber and then drill holes diagonal from the spring pads over to the those holes to, to get the oil out. Wow. Stuff like that, you know, simple stuff. How long do the valve springs last and say that one of the Dodge Boys Mopar back in the day? You know, or Warren Johnson, what do you get, two runs, five runs? Um, one? <laughs> <laughs> well, for a while there was titanium valve springs. Those, those were one. And uh, I, I'd say three, okay. four. Okay. Put new valve springs on it. Put new valve springs on it for race day. Now, what springs did he run? Who, who did he run? Oh, he ran everybody's springs. You oh. know, um, half the time I don't know what he put on them. They're, you know, they're they're in a brown box. He. Uh, Warren, Warren got a lot of special treatment from a lot of manufacturers, so I'm, he I'm sure he got a lot of really good stuff, and every once in a while he got some really ugly stuff. So, and uh, I I've got valve springs for my small block Chevrolet. That they said they're the best in the world, and uh, uh, they dropped 200 pounds in one pass. <laughs> wow, the best in the world must be made in China. Yeah. Well. It's the the best valve springs back in the mid seventies uh, at the time were, were the Chrysler Battleship springs, and then and then the, they 
they were later called short Vascos. Vasco which, jet springs. Which uh, uh, Bob Glidden had yeah. run. That that was one of his favorites. And uh, and then we couldn't find any because Bob bought them all. <laughs> <laughs> Smart man. I thought so. I thought, yeah. I says, huh, I wish I'd thought of that. So, but Economics. Uh, uh, yeah, he's. He's a hard worker. He's a smart racer. I've never seen a guy work so hard. Uh, uh, the only time I really got a chance to talk to him was when it was a rain out at Pomona. We went over to his trailer and uh, uh, Edda had a pot of coffee going all the time. Oh, so yeah. we sat around drank coffee. And uh, But they always treated me excellent. I, I, I got along with everybody. So. Did, did you ever and, see... Uh, any difference in cylinder bore size out of out of eight cylinders in one of these motors? Do they ever make some cylinders bigger than others? I I hadn't seen it. Have uh, you heard of it? Not. Well, I, I've I've heard of it, you know, to, to repair something, but I've never heard of it from to try to do it a performance standard. Okay, no. that's what I was looking for. You've ever heard of that before? Someone, no, not from a performance standpoint. Okay. The, the, the problem is, is is head gaskets and sealing and cylinder wall integrity. We're more we're more concerned about the absolute biggest board versus ring seal. Okay. Ring seal was it was all important. Uh, um, I can remember when I was racing in the late, oh, probably in the nineteen eighties uh, uh, when. Uh, they protested me and I pulled off a cylinder head so they could actually measure it. And they asked what those holes in the pistons were for. Gas ports. Gas ports, yeah. Well, they never saw them. So everybody was, what are those holes? There's some <laughs> ring seal, baby. They're secret holes. Now, were they vertical? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, but that was state of the art. Uh, um, we would use cutback rings. Uh, Nobody knew what cutback rings were, so stuff like that. That's where we learned it all back then. Well, I don't know. What's cutback ring? What do you mean? What do you say? Well, you actually take a, a standard ring, and you you bore the inside of the ring, and you machine the, in, the, the grooves in the uh, uh, piston shower. You make the ring lighter. Okay. Okay. And then, and then in the second ring, you machine it, take the tension out of it, and then I made a special pair of pliers to crimp crimp the uh, uh, expander on the uh, uh, oil ring yep. and and push it up and down the bore with a fish scale and measure the tangential tension load. So that frictional loss, by reducing that, picks up that much more that's worth going that well, effort. Uh, you know, from my own experience, a, a store-bought oil ring was 18 to 20 pounds pull on a, yep. wrapped on a fish scale, yep. uh, and just pull it up the bore and the Speed Pro Performance oil ring was oh, 14, 15. And because I had a Corvette and I put what looked like a boat pan on it, you know, a 12 quart pan with three quarts in it, um, the, I, I could run oil ring tensions of nine. Wow. Nine pounds, tangential tension or a dry sump motor could run those. And, and you could literally grab my motor by the dampener and and yeah. and turn it just by grabbing it and gripping it, turning like a big screw, with the motor without the cam in it, but with all the pistons in it. That's what that's what Where, Tony Bischoff told me about <clears throat> roller cam bearings. Once you put them in a motor, you'll always want them because you can turn that engine over so easy. Yeah. So, but that was that was one of the areas that wow. I felt I had a great advantage because I, I from from a standard thing to what I I ran. Uh, I, it's probably 30 pounds less torque to turn the motor over. Okay. Wow. And, and I figure if it, if it wasn't absorbed by the engine, it could go out the drive shaft. That's so. right. And, uh, but the trick is, 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 is when you lighten all that stuff up, you know, you got to watch out. It's not an oil consumer. So you, you got to do a lot of work on oil control. Okay. So, you uh, were none of the oil from the Valley goes goes and runs over the camshaft and down on the pistons where where you have to force all the oil out the ends and that kind of stuff do you see those problems eliminated now with the you know one millimeter rings 043 stuff all that 
do you see it improve now with technology? Uh, well, I think they've pretty much run the gamut. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I think for certain motor combinations, yeah, people can do a little bit more. I think the manufacturers of those stay within the safe tolerance. And so, yeah, somebody can creep up on the edge when they're, when they're looking for, you know, that, that three inches at the end of the track on race day. Right. Okay. So, uh, those, but you know, in pro stock racing, that's what you're looking for. You, there, you left nothing unturned. And uh, that's why I enjoyed it. I thought pro stock racing was a challenge of a lifetime and I got to play with, uh, other people's toys and got paid for it. <laughs> I love hearing it, man. And, and you know what, Larry, I'll tell you, it's like, I, it's like I've known you for a hundred years and we only just talked for like 10 minutes yesterday or whatever it was. And then today, and I, right. I appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule for drag boss garage. And there's 103 people right now listening to us. So if you uh -oh. and I were in an auditorium right now, there'd be 103 people watching us talking. Well, you know, uh, I'm st still engaged in doing things, you know, uh, um, with with my uh, uh, associate over at uh, LSX Concepts. Uh, 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 I I do all the design and engineering. You know, you want to see what I do? Just go look at the website. Uh, I was looking at all uh, yesterday. I was going through it and looking at all the fittings you have and the, the special GM fittings with that spring clip you told me about. I looked at those. Yeah, yeah. That's so, pretty cool. And uh, that's that's compared to pro stock racing. This this is really really pretty easy. The muscle car stuff and and uh, um, and I've always liked road race cars and sports cars yeah. and everything else. And uh, so uh, you know I I might want to say if people are interested in, in the history of drag racing, uh, um, they just came out with uh, Warren Johnson's biography. Yes. Um, and uh, that that really talks about everybody. I, I thought that was an exceptional exceptional biography to, to cover the, the spectrum. Well, if everything works out, wink, wink, maybe you can get the professor on W on DBG, I mean WJ and DBG. That would be a great talk, just like this. I he's uh, he's pretty generous with his time, and uh, we're gonna get so, him. Uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, but you know, if there's, if you want to narrow the focus, we just kind of uh, gabbed about overall history in general. Uh, uh, and I kind of explained where, where I look for performance, uh, and above, above just a, a, a flow bench and a grinder. Right. And, uh, you know, I could, I could probably take you some pictures on my prototype stuff and, uh, uh, you would be shocked at how it looks, you know. Uh, um, um, what do you think, guys? It, Should we do it? Him and I do another episode like this. He emails it, and I can put it on the screen, and you can see it. Yeah, we could so, do that. Uh, but uh, the, you know, where where it's going, where where uh, people never look at the mechanics of everything, and there's as much as in mechanical engineering than there is in the the, the flow bench stuff. Uh, um, I I did a bunch of Spintron work and learned a lot about valve valve train valve float um, um, valve bounce uh, um, uh, loft where you, the valve throws open and it sure. keeps going. Yes, that centrifugal force kind of pulling it. It's lofted out the cam load. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, and and how all that works and and uh, you know uh, I I have. I kind of use a thumbnail. The valve train weighs exactly what the open spring pressure is at valve flow. Uh, what, say that again. I want to write that down. The, the, the weight of the valve train, the dynamic weight, yep. is proportionate to the open pressure of the valve spring. Okay. So you say you've got open pressure of 750. Okay. We, we run 1,200, but go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, use, 1,200 is fine. So if you use 1,200, then what are you saying? The, the weight of the valve train should equal 1.2 pounds? The weight of the valve train, the weight of the valve train, its kinetic weight is 1,200 pounds. 1,200 pounds, okay. 
So if you weigh everything uh, and and you want to know what its dynamic weight is at 10,000 RPM and it valve floats with a 1,200 pound valve spring, you just weigh everything and divide it out into the 1,200 pounds where the total of all everything weighs 1,200. And and you've got to take in consideration the, the valve speed versus the push rod speed. Let's let's say it's uh, uh, the difference is the, the valve speed is a ratio of one where the push rod is a ratio of seven or eight. And you, you can calculate what what the dynamic velocities are and, and find out what to work on because all of a sudden when you say the total sum of the stuff that really weighs ounces is equal to 1,200 pounds, right. you, you got you got something to work on. Okay. Big that's, weight why reduction. We, that's why we rifle drill 7 millimeter titanium valves. 7 millimeter titanium, you're rifle drilling them? Yeah. So what's that, like 125 thousandths on, for the wall thickness? Yeah. Wow. To take the weight out of them. So, uh, so when people start looking at that kind of stuff, uh, um, and, and looking at rock or arm flex, uh, uh, sure. you can sometimes put more valve spring pressure on it and put two, two dial indicators on it and, and uh, um, realize that, uh, to turn more engine speed, you put better valve spring on it and you, and, and you, you abuse it all up, uh, because the rock arm just spends more eats it up parasitically yeah yeah and then it's got toss and bounce and sure nothing, sure then it doesn't really run right and, nothing's uh, happy uh, i uh when i set up my valve train for my cleveland my 409 cleveland i used a thing called mid lift geometry i read about it i went through it and i used a laser <coughs> guide to measure directly you know perpendicular right. angles so i could see if it laser perfect i don't know to me, it looked good. Looked good on the video. It seems to work fine. You know, I don't have a great, great understanding of it because this. I think it's the hardest thing. I think valve chain geometry and rocket ratio and all that's harder than anything else. It really is uh, because it's it's all in theory. Uh, I, I think mm -hmm. the easiest way to understand uh, um, rock arm geometry is to to uh, um, profile the cam. Just put a dial indicator in the end of the push rod uh, yep. uh, every few degrees uh, and and then put the valve train together with a checking spring and 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 do the valve and simply go every 50 thousand left and calculate the rocker ratio okay because the rocker ratio if you got a one seven rocker it's not one seven it it might be uh, um, 185 uh, uh, 1A, 175, 17, 165. And, and the concept that sometimes helps is to change the height of the rock arm and the push rod to, to have the maximum, maximum velocity of the rock arm because the rock arm actually increases the velocity at, at some point uh, um, uh, before peak lift. And, and it, ideally, I think peak, peak valve velocity uh, should be somewhere around peak piston velocity, which is um, 37 degrees after top dead center. Wow. Blows me so, away. <laughs> so, so when you start looking at the air, when the piston goes down, it creates an airflow demand. You can calculate at every degree. I wrote some programs that calculate the airflow at every degree and you can kind of look at what the motor demands versus what the cylinder heads can supply and and you can you can enhance the valve lift you may by changing the rocker stand height and the push rod length increase the lift in a slightly different area at a lower lift increase make the valve open faster where it thinks it's got Five fifty thousand spare camshaft in it, but then the rock arm slows down over the nose, so it'll spin more engine speed because it doesn't loft. So let me. This is hard to grasp. <laughs> did I lose you on that? No, you, you did, but you you, you did, but I kind of have the grasp of the basics. So let me let me say this to you. 
for, and this is for the subscribers that are, can't talk to us, but I kind of can read their mind. What you're saying is when you got that rocker arm ratio going through its movement, that ratio changes depending on where it is in the profile of the cam lobe. It's not always right. one seven three or one seven. It changes right constantly. See, I didn't know that. I think, oh, it's one seven three. That's what it is here, 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 whatever. It doesn't matter. No, uh, that no, it's, make, okay. it's a variable ratio because the rock arm is not is not a straight rock arm. It's a bent lever. So right. So Fulcrum. the right. valve, the rock arm, the length of the valve side of the rock arm actually changes length, and so does the push rod side, and but they do it at different times. So you can have push rod induced velocity, uh, valve velocity and, and valve side induced velocity at different times. And you, you can okay. use it to your advantage. Well, what you're saying is that you can use that loft as your advantage. You're going to take in well, consider, go ahead. You can, you can increase the area under the curve on the valve train without uh, increasing the loft. Okay. So by by changing the the rock arm height, and it's you know it's a matter of just a couple of dial indicators and a degree wheel and and, and lots of paper and just plot it out with different combinations and you say, gee, it's 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 soft here and it's fast there and well where do you want it? Well, and then you look at where it is in the piston cycle where the maximum velocity is, and uh, um, and I said thirty four actually the. the I think the maximum piston velocity is um, like 70 some. Um, I was thinking cam timing. So um, 70 after top dead but, center. Yeah. So uh, about when you look at the maximum demand from the piston going down the bore, if if you can sneak in by changing the rocker arm height, the push rod length a little bit and put put that valve open another 30 or 40 thousandths where where the motor's demanding the airflow it's it's if you can induce well um 25 or 30 thousand slip you put it on the flow mesh you know that might be 10 or 12 cfl per cylinder okay and that's and and just by getting the rocking geometry right sure and a hell of a lot better than trying to uh, uh port another 10, 15 CFM in the head, that's perfect. So, again, I'll recap this. You're saying you measure the rocker ratio all the way out, let's say, 70 degrees. Measure it each 10 degrees or whatever to see where it is, the maximum, correct? Well, yes, I measure the cam mo movement that, that, that every, I do every five degrees. Okay. And look at the lift every five degrees, and then I put Plot a it out. Yep. on it, and I measure... I measure the the valve movement every the same five degrees, and I look at the look at the rock rocker ratio. I say, okay, the rocker ratio uh, at five open uh, five degrees when it starts to open, uh, uh, the rocker ratio is for a one eight rocker is one seventy five, and then it goes up to one eighty five and one nine, and then then it starts slowing down, and uh, uh, so. So, but the peak lift matches what the cam card says. Okay. But but where you get the the, the rock arm induced velocity, you get you as an engine builder, you get to fix that. By raising the rocker arm. Typically by lowering. Lowering. Okay. All right. I can. Yes. This is a lot for me to sit here on on a live thing and grasp all this. I have to. I'll watch this again. Yeah. Like you, others will you, try to get you, it. You just got to play with it yeah. and, and look at with a degree wheel, plot the push rod, and then plot the valve and calculate at any given spot what the real rocker ratio is. And you go, oh, look at that. That rocker ratio is my 175 rocker is a 19 rocker at this point. Well, is I, I can move that just by changing the height of the rocker arm stand and the push rod length. Okay. And, and so uh, uh, typically where you have uh, uh, the, the midless stuff, I, I, I normally set my stuff a little shorter. Okay. So, and, um, but well, it's, I'll, I'll throw it's, this it's, 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 a, it's a place that people just don't know is tunable. Well, you're exactly right. 
that, that that's there's no doubt about that. And until you understand that concept, it's it's hard to. That's why some guys are faster than others. They get that, you know. Well, that that was a big advantage that uh, uh, um, Greg uh, Greg had when he stepped Anderson. into it because the NASCAR guys. Uh, uh, that's all they do is they they look at valve velocities and the openings and everything else because they got to make them valve springs last last uh, 500 miles and they're and they're beating on it beating them to death what so what have um what have you done in nascar what heads didn't you tell me somebody's head you did some work on was that Ford yeah, head? I, I i worked with uh some some factory back team, uh, the Morgan McClure team. Uh, um, it was, um, oh, oh, what's his name? Bill Elliott, Ernie Elliott. Uh, no. Yates. Ernie Irvin. Ernie? I worked on the, the Ernie Irvin car. Okay. And uh, he won the Daytona 500 in 1991. And and that was a set of welded welded small block heads. Uh, 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 we just literally ran away from the group. Uh, um, the uh, I I surgically cut the heads open, uh, welded up the sides of the port, welded the decks back in the head, uh, roll decked them uh, um, about three sixteenths what I could cosmetically get away with. And and uh, uh, literally welded them up and reheat treated them, machined them to look like brand new cylinder heads, and then ported them. And they were they were up about oh, thirty cfm. Wow! Over the over the very best. Now that was a cast iron head, aluminum head. Aluminum. Okay. They were allowed to use the one of the uh, Pontiac part numbered heads. So. And, uh, yeah, what, he ran so good. He just, during the race, he would just drive around to the backside of the racetrack and coast around so he didn't get in an accident. So I never restart. So, <laughs> yeah, it was the giggle factor. That was uh, at the Daytona race when uh, the NHRA race uh, got canceled because the, uh, the uh, racetrack was, they repaved uh, Arizona okay. and uh, it was lifting. So, we all got to watch the uh, NASCAR race uh, and uh, for a change. And uh, so it, it was fun. And uh, I built probably 30 pair of them. No kidding. So, 30 yeah. pair. Yeah. What's What did it take to do one pair a week? Oh, I, I, I never did one pair at a time. I would do five pair a day five pair at a time at the minimum okay, okay because because it was a lot of machine work and a lot of setup time and then when you heat tree and you stabilize things you know you really have to do it in batches so i i would probably say that uh, um 160 man hours wow and um so but mm -hmm. yeah see the guy that ran gm performance was my best customer nice so man it uh, it was that was back in the heyday you know uh you know it was take no prisoners do what you do what you can and that was what the 90s it had to be because the nascar was hot back in the mid 90s you know with bill yeah. elliott and all that and nhra yeah. was hot then before they kind of went for the fall just like nascar to me, anyways, well, I don't have a big following for those two. Yeah, the I I was very much in it through the '80s and the '90s, and and uh, um, when I, I I hate to say it, but I, I I felt like the bean counters was were trying to even out the score and put on a better show, and and I think the heyday of NHRA pro stock racing or pro stock racing in general, IHRA, AHRA, NHRA. I think, I think the heyday was over with by the turn of, turn of the century. Yep. I, I, I agree. I kind of gave up racing to watch it professionally, NHRA or NASCAR. 
around 2002, because three. It became more about the show, and I worked in it when it was all about uh, uh, you won races because you know uh, um, you were the smartest guys on the block, and uh, and it was it wasn't a physical contest, but it was also an intellectual contest. So, and uh, so I uh, I found that. Uh, 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 the the challenge that I liked, I enjoyed the the the, the you know, like like Warren would say. Well, have you done everything you could do? I said, yeah. He says, okay, do one more thing. <laughs> that, that's what oh, Johnson would say. Okay, and his actual favorite saying is, after you give him something he, that's better than anything he's ever seen, he smiles and he says, I think I can save it. <laughs> I think I can save it. Yeah, yeah, he's. That's funny. That's his humor. He's, oh my god, so, that's amazing. But yeah, Someone's, I, uh, I had uh, uh, working with him and Glidden and Jenkins and the Dodge Boys. Uh, um, I. It was it was, it was like fleeting. I don't even know what years anything was. I was just mired in and buried in it uh, uh, and I was having a good time so did and, you, uh, uh, but I did yeah no no go ahead go ahead I was gonna say it and and I did you know comp eliminator work and super stock work and uh, uh, for my my local friends and uh, uh, and because it was the challenge you know not that it made me any money uh, uh, but but to go out there and uh, super stock was still one of those things. Okay, you can't do anything. Okay, well, I like that challenge. I can't do anything, so I'll do this. Right. And so, uh, you know, everybody's trying to figure out how to cheat the porting ice as well. You know, I'm not, I, I can't be world famous cheating the porting, but let me figure out if I move the valve <laughs> and change the angle of the head and the valve and do this to the rock arm and change that, you know, well, we'll make 25 more horsepower without touching the porting. And that's, and that's not what people, the way they look at it, they're like, oh, we got to make this port better. We need more port to go faster. We need, yep. yeah, and, and I, I've seen a lot of that. And, uh, and, and a lot of it is about fuel control, getting the port shaped right, where, where the port, the fuel enters the right part of the port because, uh, uh, the, the port shaping, uh, 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 ports typically in normally aspirated cars, especially the carburetors, uh, uh, should be somewhat cork, Coke bottle shaped where, where they have a smaller part and a bigger part. Sure. And the percentage is relative to motor size and engine speed. Yep. And so, uh, uh, and, um, like the choke you're talking about. Yeah. A, a choke upstream. Yep. Uh, and, how how we would look at it is is we would look at how much carbon uh, is is in the intake valve bowl. Okay. Be because the choke traps the air in the cylinder on the overlap stroke, and if you're not doing a good job, the exhaust gases penetrate up into the intake bowl, and it. And it's like yeah. an EGR; it just pulls it sure. out of the next cycle. Sure, contaminates so the intake you, charge. You may choke it down a little bit uh, uh, to to do a better job at trapping it. Even if it hurts the flow number, a number, uh, uh, it still it still doesn't have to suck in the exhaust gases on the next stroke. Okay, that, that kind of stuff. Speaking of the yeah. rocker arms, someone asked that when we were talking about the rocker arm geometry. Are you talking about with stud mount or shaft? Because with a checking spring and the actual spring, you're coming to run will change the ratio of the rocker, especially with the loom. Right. I think he's just talking about deflecting. Yeah, there, there's deflection. rock arm. There's rock arm flex and, yep. and everything else. You can check it with a real spring, but and and you can you can look at the bending of the rock arm, uh, uh, and and you can do it both ways and put that in it. I, I just happened to, because it's on a motor stand, just just pre-check it, and and most of the stuff that I work work on 
is more pro stock oriented with, okay. you know, large base circle camshafts mm-hmm. and steel rockers and all that kind of stuff. So, um, uh, but you can, you can put that into the equation. Uh, but at the same time, you can look at the rock arm flex, the rock arm flex normally happens in the first 250 a lift. Okay. I didn't know and, that. And, and then as it goes over the nose, yep. what helps loft the valve is that that bending of the rock arm uh, uh, goes into the valve. It, okay. it, it causes the loft. So if you could soften the rock arm bending as the valve goes over the nose, uh, even, you know, you, you can sometimes uh, uh, do a better job of making more power and keeping the valve train alive. I know my own engine that I built I measured the piston valve clearance with a dial indicator. Let's just use an example, 54 thousandths. Then I measured it loaded with all the regular valve train on. Then I had like 78 thousandths, you know. And right. my point was, <clears throat> with a loaded valve train, you can run a bigger cam. You can run that much more lift, a little bit more duration than the next guy. That's another horsepower advantage. Does that make sense? Right. Well, when you race a 287, you learn real quick uh, uh, how to give away compression ratio with cutting valve pockets too deep. So uh, um, I used I used to run my intake piston to valve clearance at deck plus five. Deck plus five? Yeah. <laughs> at at 10,000 RPM? Yeah. Because the intake valve chases the piston. Right, right. It's exhaustion you got to worry about. And, and if the deck is 40, I add 5,000 to it with a checking spring. And by the time you put it all together, it's got you know, 35, 40, 20 on the intake. Yeah. But on the exhaust, I would run 90, 95. Uh, and I'm talking about even at the time, uh, um, uh, big valve springs. Okay. Everybody was running 500 valve, pound valve springs. And I was running my valve springs at 1,000. Well, 800, 1,000. Yeah, wow. Yeah, back in 1975. Jesus. So, uh, uh, yeah, I'd run them on the intake, and I run left less lift on the exhaust, and because springs don't wear out, they get short. Okay. They they still produce the same rate; they just get short. So, when they when they get a hundred short in the intake, I put them on the exhaust because I run less lift. Right. So I get more cycle life out of the valve spring. Man, that's smart thinking. How so, about how about this? There's a question from uh, Adrian from New Zealand. He's asking a question. How did Bill Elliott pull back two laps under the green in the mid '80s and then leave them all for dead? How did he make know. so much power? I don't know. Okay, Good. Um, honest answer. There's uh, uh, there's so much to the NASCAR racing, you know. My thing was in the GM involvement. Uh, in the 1990s and uh, primarily through uh, their their earning order from program and a few others right. uh, that ended up ended up with my stuff so uh, um, and uh, so when, in fact once they got done running my stuff for a while they just created a new cylinder head so okay and uh, do you, but do you think the CNC industry kind of cut your cylinder head production down or your business down? I, I would have to say that, yeah, because uh, before before the CNC industry came along, I would do handcrafted from scratch cylinder heads, yep. about 30 pair a year, 30, 35. And then, and then when the CNC came along and the tracers, uh, I, I would see my own product competing against myself. And when I got down to, to, to about 15, uh, um, I, I, I just wasn't capitalizing on all the work. Okay. That's why I shifted into designing rock arms and rock arm geometry. That's, that's why I, I know a bit about it because I, I built some of the first steel rock arms for NHA pro stock before Jessel or anybody else. TMD, yep. So, uh, but not get me wrong, they have excellent parts. Sure. <laughs> they, uh, they, they saw the error of their way making race car parts out of aluminum, made steel rock arms for, you know, racing. So, 
I bought I was four sets of them, the, the steel rocker arms from T and D. Right. A buddy of mine, three or four of us went in, so I bought a set that I'm going to be using. So they said, stay away from the aluminum if you're going to have a, a serious drag motor. Stay with steel. So that's what we're doing. Well, actually, the the steel rocker arm dynamically running them on the spintron is actually lighter than the aluminum rocker. Really? Yeah, dynamically lighter. Okay. I I built and tested rock arms out of steel, aluminum, mine, Jessels, TNDs. Uh, I even built titanium rock arms. Figure, figuring, uh, I I I went to the manufacturers up in Washington, the aircraft industry, and looked at all the bells and whistles, and I was shocked that the steel rock arm was dynamically lighter than the aluminum rock arm for the same flex for actually less less flex dynamically lighter had less wow. built up kinetic energy in it. that's 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 a shocker I, I wrote an outline on it one time i don't know where it got off to but yeah they um so i'm looking at but, the time now we're, we're about one hour and 55 minutes in and i told my wife that we'd probably finish at two hours because we could sit here okay. and talk all night. But I would like to, you think about this, I'd like for us to maybe talk again, like specifically about like rocker arm ratio. I think that's a black art that people don't understand, you know, some kind of a easy way to <coughs> explain it to the masses, so to speak. I don't know if that's something. Yes, that I'll, 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 I could probably do a better job of coming up with some terminology that the average person could understand sure and a little a little better and it is a black art because the rocker arm people don't talk to the camshaft people even today really you think well, the camshaft have... people are all about you know putting you know, lift under the curve and the yep. shape and the acceleration yep. rate and everything else yep well the rocker arm guys are are doing or not doing the same thing you you play around with rocker stand height uh, and push rod length and all of a sudden you look at the rocker ratio moves all over the place well these two these guys aren't talking where do you where do you want to put the maximum bow velocity you want to put it where the motor needs it the most where the piston the piston demand is greater than the cylinder head can fulfill okay and and uh, and you start looking at those numbers uh, uh, it's it's not hard to write a program that uh, you calculate uh, the motor demand for virtually. I have a program I can put in how many degrees, virtually every degree, and and look at the air demand uh, uh, on a on a piston cycle, and and then kind of look at your your cam timing versus your airflow numbers and marry the two together. And then you can look and go, you know, if I put more more rock around right there, I bet you I'd make more power. Okay, I can dig it. So, but it it's a and the the thing is is what people have most of is time. So, this is this is one of those time experiences that people can do, and just by uh, um, lowering a stand down or shimming something up, or or they uh, uh, taking the uh, uh, adjustment screws and running them out to the to to extra long and then backing them up all the way and changing the push rod length and don't even change the rocker stand height. And, and you'll throw another curve in there. Wow. This is this is a guy take okay. his motor on an old motor stand and look at all this stuff and try it all out and go, you know, put a degree wheel. I have a degree wheel that mounts, mounts on the back on the flywheel side. I took an old flywheel and turned it into a degree wheel. Yeah. So I can I can move all that stuff around and, and keep track of that. And then we go went over and run it on the spin tron. So. And this is the stuff yeah. that, that the people that are listening here can do on their own builds, no matter what. All they need is a couple of dial indicators and some basic math skills, which I'm not good at, but they can figure this stuff out and put that rocker arm ratio where it needs to be in that particular time of uh, the cycle. And if they if they don't know, they they can put the stand height here in this push rod length and put the stand height there in a totally different push rod length or adjust their screw position or have two sets of push rods that runs the screws 
down farther or, or back farther right. and, and, you know, simply run it on the dyno or run it down the racetrack. And you, uh, uh, you can, you can do comparisons and, and just work in a direction. But, but that's the thing is, that's, that's the black area is, uh, um, the, um, camshafts married to the, to the valve train, to the rockers, to the valve and, and, and the motor. They're, they're all, they're all close and, and they're all really have a nice product that, that don't blow up. And that's, that's important. Sure. But when a guy's done everything he can do, then a, a guy starts looking at ring drag, and, uh, combustion efficiency, dead areas in the combustion chamber, uh, um, uh, camshaft, about rocker arms and all those, those other areas that, that you it's more mechanical than it is uh, flow bench wise. Right. So, um, and I guess I never, I, you know, I'm so pumped in my head about flow numbers and camshafts and head flow and velocity that I don't even think about rocker arm geometry or ratio. It doesn't even, you know, Hey, it looks like it's okay. I should be good to go. I'm missing a big well, part of it. I can tell you right now, but you know, on your flow bench, you open the valve 30 thousands and, and the flow number can explode. Sure. Well, if I can get you that thirty thousands by changing the rocker geometry a little bit, well, that's like a free porting job, right? So, and and this is the area. Look, when you've done everything else and you're looking for those extra things, this this is where it is. Uh, 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 rocket geometry is it's it is a black card. It's and nothing, and there's no really right or wrong. It's it's what works for you. That's my line. What works for you? <laughs> one motor that one motor that may maybe have too big an intake ports may appreciate a slower intake valve. The the, the rocker ratio with the first three hundred is is lazy, so okay. the valve isn't exposed to that big port. Another way to look at it, I'll tell you. Well, it, and and there's no right answer. It, it's it's just knowing what you have and, and to know that, Hey, I can go this way or I can go that way. You know, we don't know how much, how much ring drag we can, we can take out of the motor until it smokes. Right. Yeah. And put you a know, vacuum so, pump on it. Whoops. <laughs> well, we better, better, better put another two or three pounds in that oil ring. Uh, so that kind of stuff. And, uh, awesome. and, and, and valve springs and, and, and spin trons. I, I think, if, if a spintron is at least as important as a full bench. I've heard of them. You know, I've seen them in magazines, but other than that, I don't really know much about them or their use other than, hey, is that thing going to valve float at X amount of RPM? Yeah. What it does is you, you spin it and you, you draw a graph at 2,000 RPM where yep. it's really stable, and then you run it up to whatever, 10,000, okay. and you look at the graph, and all of a sudden, you know, what the regular graph is and the graph you got that that the, the because you're you've got a an optic on the head of the valve and you go oh my god the head of that valve is someplace else and 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 it lost it's it's hanging up and then it, then the the valve is actually in valve toss or valve float yeah. and then it slams back and it knocks the keepers out or breaks the keepers which is very fairly common takes out the or, seat or or the valve bounces on the seat yeah. because it got an oil can effect, and, and that's that's where the, the the black art is. Okay. So, and the average person can take and uh, uh, soften the over the nose numbers a little bit, typically enhance the the area under the curve a little bit, the the three hundred lift range, because. You know, the, the valve's really going in the wrong direction for the first two, 200, 250 lift. So you really you really don't want a lot of rocker velocity until the valve gets to 300. Okay. Yeah, I don't even look at the flow numbers below 300 lift because, the, the in fact, if they're a little, little, little bad because things are a little small, they normally run better. Velocity is the king, not flow numbers. It's velocity, isn't it? Well, uh, the two, the flow number with velocity and inducing the velocity. So 
and uh, and then trapping the air in, in, inside the valve bolt uh, on the overlap stroke, especially when it's under the curve, when it's when it's under the torque curve, like on uh, road race cars, uh, trapping the air in, in the valve bolt instead of having the exhaust work its way up the okay. intake port. That's that's the reason why some cars you step on them and it's like stepping on a melon. They they have nothing, and then all of a sudden they explode. Well, it's yeah. it's it's the world's best DGR system. That's too, too big an intake port. Yeah. So hello Cleveland. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. The the Cleveland. Well, they they fixed the Cleveland by putting a shorter rod in. It's five five hundred, isn't it? I thought it was five eight seven is what the Cleveland is. So, or that was. But you're saying they put a five eight hundred in it? No, I think the I think the what's a stock Cleveland rod? I think it's five eight seven. Top of my I head. I thought it was five five hundred. It was five five hundred. I should know that, a, but I don't know off the top of my head. I don't remember all that stuff. Yeah. Someone else. I, I know. I know that when I put my big port turbo castings on my 287 that it was lackluster if i let it drop too low i really had to choke the chicken and run it up on rpm scale and uh, uh when i put a hundred short rod in it, it it just woke it up yeah 587 is a stock cleveland yeah okay so uh now i see 575 so i don't it doesn't matter yeah 578 i mean we're on a we don't need to keep going into it, but let's do this. Let's let's end it here, Larry, so we don't keep going. Okay. Let's plan on another time when and we'll concentrate on rocker ratio because, and I need to read about it more and get a better feel for it because it, that's a topic that so many can pick up horsepower without having the heads need any work. That's the key. You're just let it people see, you know. And I can I can revisit my notes and sure. And, probably do a little better job of explaining and explaining the some of the things a person can look for okay perfect yeah what we'll do okay. is i'm i'm going to end the broadcast here and then me and you will talk just for a minute so i want to okay tell everybody hey i appreciate you guys showing up listening to the live chat with larry olson right now there's 103 104 people on here that's a lot of people to come on for a little live chat it wasn't even really uh, planned out, except for t today we said, let's do it. And I said, let's go. So that's awesome. Appreciate you guys being here. So stay tuned. Maybe tomorrow we'll be able to get uh, the kids out here. They want to open up all these boxes back here and get, I got to get rid of that stuff. See what's in there. It's a surprise moment. So stay tuned, guys, to Drag Boss Garage. And I appreciate you being here. Please like and subscribe. Get this channel going. I'll try to do more on getting the videos out there.